Hi class, welcome back to the second half of lecture. So uh, for this part of the lecture, we're gonna talk about our attempts to send signals uh, out into space in the hope that they might be received and interpreted by extraterrestrial intelligences. So in the background here, uh, some of you will recognize is the famous matrix code. Uh, this is the streaming code that you see in the background of the Matrix movies. And every time I saw this, when I see the Matrix, it reminds me of these efforts that we're talking about, namely that you can encode very detailed information uh, in the form of just a few simple characters. And the nature of the messages that we're sending out into outer space are even simpler than the matrix code that you see in that there's only two characters we use, ones and zeros, but it's this same kind of notion. And so this is what this always reminded me of when, uh, when I see the movies. So, uh, <coughs> pardon me. Let me go ahead and share some slides. <coughs> so, um, the opening slide here is something you've seen before. This is the cover of the Voyager record and lots of the same principles that we've talked about before when we talked about the Voyager record are going to apply here, namely that we're using a common uh, reference system. Uh, we're going to use uh, hydrogen and radio wavelengths and mathematical and science principles to uh, ensure that we're quote unquote speaking the same language with whoever might receive the signals. Uh, but then the idea that you can make pictures from the data is really gonna be the key to this, okay? So there have been many examples of this in the past, uh, 10 or 15 or so individual messages that I can think of. Uh, but we're gonna talk very specifically about the Arecibo message because it's probably the most famous one and it's the one that you'll most often encounter people discussing, okay? So we'll start by talking about this idea of what we call communication without preamble. Uh, we'll talk about how we encode messages, and then we'll end by showing you what the Arecibo message looks like. So communication without preamble is something that you can and certainly may encounter in your life here on Earth all the time, uh, in that it's all about trying to communicate with someone who doesn't have the same communication foundation that you have. Now, in general, we mean language, and on Earth, even though you have a different language of someone, you can often still communicate with them because we have common experiences and common cultural traditions that are shared across many different cultures in the world that allow you to at least get together in the same thought space, even if you don't speak the same languages, and try and understand what each other are talking about. But from the perspective of languages, there are about 6,000, maybe 7,000 languages that are spoken across the earth. Now, lots of them are widespread. There's you know, a billion people who speak Chinese. There's about a billion people who speak Hindi. Uh, there's lots of English, French, Spanish, uh, you know, all of those kinds of languages. But there are lots of other smaller languages that are very localized either to their cultures or their countries. Um, and of all of those languages, about 2,000 of them have fewer than a thousand speakers. And that's a bit worrisome because it means those languages very likely will die out as those native speakers um, uh, 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 die and if they don't pass the language on to a new generation of speakers. So the question about uh, communication without preamble is to imagine that you had to communicate with someone who didn't speak your language. So this is part of the microproject exercise you'll do, is to imagine to ha having to send a written letter uh, to someone in another country where they don't speak the same language of you and to elicit a particular response from them. Maybe you want them to send their grandmother's cookie recipe or tell you if you have a pet or tell you what day they were born. How would you communicate that if you don't actually speak the same languages? Okay, so this is the whole premise of communication without, uh, without preamble. How do you just start a communication and uh, help each other understand what you're, what you're actually all about? The problem's really exacerbated when you're talking about trying to communicate with extraterrestrial intelligences, because not only do you not know if they have a language, they don't even have necessarily the same cultural experiences, the same societal bases, the same physiological uh, uh, requirements that you and I have, right? If you're trying to communicate the idea of eating, 
taking a piece of pizza and sticking it in your mouth, it's not clear that any alien species that you and I encounter it, uh, may have mouths or eat or gather energy in the same way you and I do. That's what we mean by a common, common experience, okay? But when we do think about talking to extraterrestrial uh, civilizations, we really operate from the assumption that they're going to have to understand the laws of nature as we do. If they didn't, then they wouldn't be communicative over the vast interstellar distances that we've been talking about. So what do we mean when we mean they understand the laws of nature? We mean they have come to the understanding that we, we have that there are immutable language that nature describes itself in. And that language is mathematics, and there are fundamental mathematical principles that are common uh, no matter how you want to describe mathematics. So a good example of that is if you look at the ratio of the diameter of a circle to its circumference, it's a number that we call pi, okay? And pi is a universal constant, and it will be the same no matter who tries to measure it, as long as you recognize that the circumference of a circle is related to the diameter of the circle. Okay, so that's an example of an immutable mathematical property. Um, we assume that if they are thinking about astronomy and they have started to learn about the cosmos, they will have discovered what we have discovered. And um, foremost among those discoveries is that hydrogen is the most common element in the universe. It was the first fundamental element created, and it is the composition of most of the stars that we see, and it is the most prevalent loose unincorporated gas that's not in the form of stars throughout the universe. So this image that you see here is a hydrogen map of our own Milky Way galaxy. So you can see the galaxy stretching there across the center of the image, okay? And if you do recognize that hydrogen is the most common element in the universe, then you also know that the primary emission of hydrogen, the most common emission of hydrogen in the universe is this so-called 21 centimeter line. Okay, so that is a radio frequency line. It is radio light that is emitted uh, from a particular uh, uh, transition in molecular hydrogen, okay? And it is the most common hydrogen emission mechanism in the universe, which is why we like to observe the universe in 21 centimeters, okay? Now, these are all fundamental principles. And so the question is, is when you have those fundamental principles as a foundation, how can you imagine that you might use them to communicate with an extraterrestrial intelligence, okay? And so one of those fundamental principles that seems quite useful is the idea of prime factors, okay? So some of you will remember from your mathematics training that a prime number is a number that can be factored that is broken into numbers that can be multiplied together to give the number, that can be factored only into themselves and the number one. Okay, so good examples of prime number are three. The only way to get three through multiplication is one times three. And 11, the only way to get 11 through multiplication is one times 11. Okay, so that's what we mean by prime numbers. Now, there are special numbers which can be factored, they're not prime, but when you do factor them, the only thing that they can be factored into are two prime numbers, okay? So an example of that is the number 21. The only way to factor, 21 is not prime, okay? It, it can be factored into one times 21, but it can also be factored into three times seven. But that's the only way to factor 21, only three and only seven because three is prime and seven is prime, this is one of those special numbers that we're talking about. An example of a number that isn't special in this way is 18. 18 can be factored into one times 18, okay? But it's not prime because it can be factored into two times nine. Well, two is prime, but nine is not. 18 can also be factored into three times six. Well, three is prime, but six is not. Okay, 18 can also be factored into two times three times three. Okay, those are all prime factors, but it's three prime factors instead of two prime factors. Okay, so we're only interested in numbers that can be factored into two prime factors. And you can find all those numbers you want by just taking two prime numbers, any two prime numbers you want, 11 times three, and it makes one of these unique numbers, 33, which can only be factored into 11 and 3.
Okay. So why is that useful? Well, the person who first thought that this was useful, I think he was the first person, was our old friend, Frank Drake. Okay. And Frank thought it was useful because this is a way that you can encode messages for an extraterrestrial intelligence that would be recognizable as plausibly being of intelligent origin. Because if you can send a message that consists of some amount of information that's represented by these kind of specialized prime numbers, it almost certainly comes from an intelligent origin because there's no natural processes in nature that naturally generate prime numbers. Okay, so how did Frank exhibit that? Frank was interested in communication without preamble. So he invented a message in 1962. He sent it to a whole bunch of his friends without any explanation, and most of them decoded it. Okay, so what was that message? It was 551 digits, where the digit was either a one or a zero. Okay, and if you look at 551, you realize it's one of these special numbers. It can only be factored into prime, uh, two prime numbers, 19, which is prime, and 29, which is prime. And if you were to arrange all of those ones and zeros into a grid, it creates the image that you see here on the right. And when you look at that image, you may recognize that it has a few things that look like they're important, okay? So if you look at the left side of the image, there's kind of a big O at the top, and there are nine dots, some bigger than others, as you go down the side. That looks mysteriously like the sun and the nine planets of the solar system. Down in the lower center, there's mysteriously something that looks like a stick figure, okay? If you look near the top, okay, in the upper right, there's a big square surrounded by eight smaller squares. And right next to it, there's a similar big square surrounded by six small squares. Well, that looks a little bit like carbon, six electrons, and oxygen, eight electrons, okay? So this whole message is full of symbolism like that. And Frank said it to, admittedly, a bunch of his scientific friends, but they all figured it out. And this is the model for communication without preamble with a technologically advanced alien civilization. If alien scientists got this message, could they figure it out? And Frank sent it to some alien scientists, scientist friends of his, and they were able to figure it out, okay? So this is the foundation for many of the kinds of messages that we have sent out into the universe, in particular, the Arecibo message. So the Arecibo message is named for the Arecibo telescope. It is located in Puerto Rico. It is built in a natural depression in the hills. It is a suspended radio dish. It's suspended, I don't know, 15, 20 feet above the ground. So it can be steered a little bit. And it has these gigantic towers that hold the radio receiver up over the dish. And from 1963 to 2011, it was the largest radio telescope in the world. It is still, I would say, still the preeminent radio telescope in the world. <clears throat> it has been succeeded in size by a 500-meter telescope in China, uh, but that is a very new telescope. It's only uh, less than a decade old at this point, and they are still uh, improving it and still working out the kinks with it. But uh, Arecibo has been eclipsed in size, but it is still one of the primary radio telescopes that we use, okay? Now, it has been used both in SETI searches, looking for SETI signals, and also in the transmission of the SETI signal that you and I are talking about, okay? Oh, this is what Arecibo looks like if you build it out of Lego, okay? So how do you construct a signal to send from a telescope like the Arecibo telescope, okay? So the basic foundation of our signal is the bit. Okay, so uh, a bit is basically a, a representation of a system of anything that can be represented in one of two possible ways. Okay, so on or off, that is a bit representation. It's either one way or it's the other. Up or down, it's either one way or the other. True or false, or in the case of the bit, one or zero. Okay, so the one or zero is the foundational numerical representation of the bit, and it's the way we talk about bits. Okay, so Frank sent all of his friends a series of bits, ones and zeros. Okay, how do you take that idea and convert it into a radio signal? 
Okay, well, you imagine that your radio transmitter is sending out energy. And so it can either be sending energy or not sending energy. Sending energy or not sending energy. So when it is sending energy, that's like the bit being on. One, I'm sending energy. And then when I'm not sending energy, that's like the bit being off, zero. So on, one, off, zero. And so you can imagine constructing a radio signal, on, off, on, on, off, on, off, 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 on, okay? One, zero, one, one, zero, one, zero, 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 one. You can construct any radio signal you want by just varying the power that you're sending out from your radio signal transmitter, okay? So this is the foundation for building radio signals that you can transmit. You just have to turn the power on and off in the appropriate sequence to represent your ones or zeros, okay? So how do you make a Drake style pictorial message? Well, you basically do the grid, met, uh, the grid problem backwards. So let's talk, look at a message and decode it so you can see how it works. Okay, so the first thing is you're gonna make it into a grid and you're gonna decide to color in the grid rather than leave it as ones or zeros. So decide ahead of time which, color, which number you're gonna color in. Okay, so it doesn't matter which one, you'll get the same mess, uh, image either way. Uh, so here I'm gonna color in ones and I'm gonna leave zeros blanks. Okay, so the number of bits in your message has to be able to be written in terms of only two prime factors. Okay, so here are nine digits. Okay, so this is my radio signal that I've sent through my radio telescope. On, off, on, off, on, off, on, off, on. Okay, well that is appropriate. It's nine digits, it can be broken into two prime factors, three by three. So that means it can be represented as a three by three grid, right? The two prime factors are basically how many rows and how many columns of your data are you going to have? And so you draw out your grid that has the appropriate number of rows and columns given by your two prime factors. And then you take your numbers and you just write them in the grid in order. You just go across the rows, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one. And then you color in the grids. And you can see that that message represents an X. Okay? So that's, that's the way the game works. So we did this with the Arecibo message. Okay? So the Arecibo message was sent in 1974 towards the globular cluster M13. Okay, so uh, M13, uh, that's a picture of it there on the left. You can see it in the constellation Hercules. So right when uh, it gets dark at this time of year and you look to the eastern sky, the star Vega is rising and Hercules is just ahead of uh, Vega in the sky. So it's rising ahead of Vega and Hercules' body kind of looks like a keystone shape there. And over on one side of the keystone is the globular cluster M13. If you are out away from a city, you can sometimes see it with your naked eye. If your eyes are good and you know what you're looking for, but you can definitely see it in a pair of binoculars. So it's a great thing to try and see. Okay, M13 uh, is a group of about 400,000 stars. It's orbiting around the Milky Way. The Milky Way has about 200 of these globular clusters, um, and it's about 25,000 light years away. So we sent this message towards M13. There's a ton of stars it's gonna get through when it gets there, but it's not going to get there for 25,000 years. So by the time this message that we sent gets to M13, our civilization is going to be long, long gone. And by the time anyone in M13 who might be able to receive and interpret and send a message back, uh, our civilization will be even longer gone by the time the signal gets back to Earth, if indeed they can tell that it came from Earth. Okay? So what does the Arecibo message look like? So this is all of the digits of the Arecibo message. Okay? And we'll talk about the form and function of it here in a minute. Okay? But I can uh, turn this into a radio signal and send it into outer space. I can also take this data and push it through a sound generator so you can listen to it. Okay, so if you were doing like Jodie Foster and listening to what your radio uh, telescope hears on headphones, this is what you would hear. Okay, 
So that may or may not, that may or may not sound like a, uh, uh, um, an intelligent signal to you, but that's what the signal is like going out into outer space, okay? So what is the message? Well, in the message, there are 1,679 digits. So as you might imagine, 1,679 is a special number. It is factorable into two primes, 23 by 73. Now at this point, you may, if you try and decode this message, realize that there's a problem, okay? And the problem is, I don't know if the 23 is the number of rows, or if it's the number of columns, okay? But that's not actually a problem because it could be either. And the point is, is if you make it one, you can also make it the other and you can look at the two messages and see if one makes sense and the other doesn't, okay? So this is what the message looks like broken into 23 rows, each 73 characters long. So I just go back to the Arecibo message. I start at the beginning. I count over 73 characters and I put in the carriage return. And then I count over 73 characters and I put in the carriage return. 73, and when I get all done, I'll have 23 rows, okay? And that's what you get right there if you do that, okay? If I take that message and I color in all the ones, I get the image at the bottom. And if you look at that image, it doesn't look like much. Okay, so at this point, you're like, well, I still think this was an intelligent signal, so let me do it the other way. Let me, instead of making 23 rows with 73 characters, let me make 73 rows with 23 characters. And if you do that, almost like magic, you can see there is structure in the image. Okay, so this does, even, even without coloring it in, this message looks like it has some weird patterns in it, okay? You can definitely see some things that look like straight lines. You can definitely see some things that look like curved lines. What is this all about, okay? The idea of encoding a pictogram, a picture, is that if there is interesting structure, maybe it will incite someone to look more closely at it. Now that's debatable. Lots of SETI scientists debate whether or not this will or will not work but this is the idea that we've had, and it's an idea that Frank Drake has uh, promoted, and it's the idea that many of our messages that we send out have been based on. So what is the message? Well, let me color it in to give you a better sense of it. Um, I've color-coded it here so that I can talk to you about all the different things in the message. Okay, so what is it? So the very top row, okay, in white there, is the number system used in this message, how to count from one to 10. Okay, the purple grouping of numbers there are the numbers 1, 6, 7, 8, and 15, which are the atomic numbers of the essential elements needed for life on Earth, right? So one of the things we've talked about uh, throughout this uh, quarter is the idea that we are carbon chauvinists that we think life has to be or should be carbon-based and that it should depend on water. And if I look at uh, DNA and all of those sorts of things that you and I are made of, these are the essential elements that life here on Earth is made of, okay? The next group of green characters there are the uh, chemical formulas for the DNA nucleotides. The uh, uh, blue, uh, kind of swoopy lines there is a pictorial representation of the DNA double helix and written down the middle of the helix there is the length of the number of base pairs, the number of base pairs in the human DNA. So that's about a billion base pairs. The DNA intersects a human figure down there at the bottom. Okay, the stick figure, which you'll recognize as being uh, similar to the one Frank Drake originally put in his original puzzle. On the um, uh, left side of the figure is an indicator that tells you the average height of the human in wavelengths of the radio light that was used to send the signal. And on the left is a number representing the population, uh, it's not on the left, sorry, I'm right, left, dyslexic. On this side, on the right, is the population of Earth at the time the message was sent. Below the human is, again, that map of the solar system, the sun with nine planets. 
The third planet is offset towards the figure to tell where the uh, uh, message originated from. And then below that is the Arecibo telescope, a pictogram of the Arecibo telescope. And right below the pictogram is the size of the telescope that was used to transmit the message. Okay, so all of that information is encoded in this pictogram and we've sent it out into space and maybe someday it will be received by extraterrestrial intelligences somewhere in the globular cluster M13. Okay, now if you're interested in these messages, there have been many other messages sent as I've indicated. Uh, the best uh, summary of all of them that I've found is on Wikipedia. They have a list of all the messages, when they were sent, where they were sent, um, how long they think it will take for the message to get to the destination that they sent to. Uh, and so you can go read about all of those different messages that have been sent out into the cosmos. But the Arecibo message is certainly one of the most famous ones. And if you read about uh, books about extraterrestrial intelligence uh, and the attempts to communicate with it, it's the message that you'll certainly read about the most. Okay, so that's all I'm going to say uh, for this lecture. Uh, next lecture, we will come back to the Drake equation and talk about the Drake equation a little bit. And for the last lecture of the quarter, we will talk about relativity and the possibility of starship travel. So that's what we got for the rest of the week. I hope you're all staying safe, and I will see you all again soon. Take care.